morning and a, a warm welcome to the 11th meeting in 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn mobile phones or other devices to silent as they, so they don't disrupt the meeting. Um, we've received apologies today from Mark Griffin, MSP, and from Adam Tompkins, MSP, and uh, Adam is um, substituted by Gordon Lindhurst this morning, so warm welcome. Uh, agenda item one is decision to take items in private, so I ask if the committee agree to take items three and four in private. Thank you. Uh, agenda, agenda item two is consultation on early years assistant, assistance Best Start Grant Regulations. To inform the policy, the Scottish Government is currently mm -hmm. consulting on draft regulations for the Best Start Grant, and the Best Start Grant will be one of the first of all benefits to be delivered from summer 2019, and the consultation closes on the 15th of June. And we are delighted to welcome to committee this morning Claire Simpson, Manager of Parenting Across Scotland, Ross Bragg, Director of Maternity Action, Gavin Fergie, Lead Professional Office, Scotland, Wales and Commercial Development, Health Sector, Unite the Union, and Sonia Scott, welcome, a consultant in Public Health Medicine, NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and I, I thank those that have provided briefings for today's meeting um, for doing so. Um, and I would like to open with a question about, um, obviously, the, this is a consultation, the regulations have a, a final policy, objectives haven't been finalised, so I would like to ask briefly if, if whether you feel that there are any uh, gaps in the regulations at the moment, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to Claire first. Mm. Thank you. Um, I think we think that there are a number of gaps, one around the qualifying benefit, that maternity allowance ought to be covered, in that and ought to be allowed as an eligible criteria. But also around teenage parents, it's not so much a gap, but there's a lot of dispute there. And I've ended up, I wasn't sure myself whether the benefit should be paid directly to teenagers or to their grandparents. And I thought quite a lot about it, but actually I went to organizations that worked with young parents and to young parents themselves. And I think without exception, Everybody said to, te you know, to the parents themselves. And people felt that we allow people to marry in this country at 16, which implies that we allow them to start a family. And if we think they're capable of that responsibility, then I think we need to give them the money to do so and empower them to become young parents and to you know, spend the money as they wish. So those are, the, I suppose, the two major things that we're concerned about. I can I just ask, obviously the, the um, grant is means tested and it's designed to get those most it needs. Um, do you think a, a general application to those in maternity allowance would meet that criteria of, of giving it to the people most it needs? I think that the, obviously maternity allowance isn't means tested and so there are some people that would be on higher incomes as well as those on lower incomes. But I think this parliament has really tried to address the question of unfair work and low paid work and many of the people who get maternity allowance will be those very people. It's a very small uptake in Scotland at the minute, it's 700, so I think we would catch some people who are really at low income and miss out on other benefits there may be the there may be some who take it up who are on higher incomes. Thank you. Uh, Ros, would you like to come in? Uh, yes. Um, well, I think firstly we'd really like to welcome the Best Start grant. It's a fabulous um, new source of support for parents on low incomes. And we do see a lot of pregnant women and new parents who are really struggling. So I think this is a very welcome contribution. I think the two areas that we'd flag as areas for further thought are maternity allowance and also the situation of some migrant parents. <coughs> With maternity allowance, one of the problems is for uh, specifically the group of women on maternity allowance who have no, who are sole parents and have no housing costs because they're not entitled to universal credit and consequently not entitled to the Best Start grant, whereas if they were receiving the same amount of statutory maternity pay, they would be receiving roughly £400 a month of universal credit and, of course, the Best Start grant. So it is an anomaly. And these women are predominantly lower income earners, but not exclusively lower income earners, as 
maternity allowance is also available for those who are, for various reasons, not entitled to statutory maternity pay. Um, but we would like to see some provision made for them. There are various ways to approach this, and an exceptional circumstances provision with guidance is one possibility there. The other group we're concerned about are migrants who are, for reasons of immigration law, precluded from accessing benefits. And that may be <coughs> EEA nationals who don't meet the criteria uh, to gain benefits, or they may be nationals of other countries who have no recourse to public funds as a condition of their visa. In both groups, we have uh, women and families who've been living in the UK for some years who intend to bring up their children in the UK and are often living in quite severe poverty and have, at the moment really have no recourse to financial support. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Gavin, Turkey. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Thanks very much for the opportunity to address you this morning and to speak to you. Uh, I am a health visitor and I do represent the majority of health visitors in the country. We welcome the opportunity to speak to you, but we are not at all experts on social security uh, legislation or how to draft such. What we see are the impact on the families that we deal with of poverty. So any measure that improves that child's um, future is to be recommended, but on the fine detail of legislation, we, we can't give you that detail. But we were surprised and uh, happy to be invited because you made strong representation that you wanted health visiting opinion around the table. So perhaps there's a question further on that I can give more detail on. But in this one, we don't see any obvious gaps, but we applaud the direction of trying to reduce poverty within families and the children within those families. Okay, thank you. And Sonia Scott? Hi. I also um, welcome the Best Start grant and the extended eligibility and value. I think that's fantastic. Um, like Gavin, I'm not an ex expert in social security systems or welfare, uh, but coming from the perspective of improving the situation of people on low incomes, I think there are a number of issues. So I support the comments that have already been made. I think maternity allowance would be um, something to consider in terms of uh, an eligible benefit for this grant. And in addition, in um, one of the submissions, uh, students were mentioned and students on income-related bursaries who may miss out um, because they're not uh, entitled to housing benefit. Um, I also support um, the comment um, about young people themselves getting the grant directly. I think that respects their autonomy and I think it also gives a message of trust, trust that they will be considered and how they use the grant. And I think we could include in the information that we give to those receiving the grant sources of support on, and advice on how it could be used sensibly. Um, on technical notes, there are a couple of things I, I noticed, and forgive me if I'm missing some of the subtlety of the legislation, but how quickly applications were, were processed, I didn't notice that in the regulations. There was some time periods for how quickly reconsiderations would be undertaken, but not how quickly they would be processed. And um, how payments will be made to those without a bank account, I wonder if that had been considered. I think in the regulation it talks about BACS payments. Um, finally, um, I wondered whether the committee ha or, or the civil servants drafting the legislation had considered whether there'd be a way to automate notification of entitlement to this grant. Uh, we now have a number of our health boards that have um, electronic maternity systems. We also obviously have our birth register, so we have a way of knowing when children are born. And if in setting up our new social security IT system, they could talk to each other, um, these systems, there might be a way for it to be flagged um, to the social security system that we have someone eligible. Unfortunately, I think it would require that our social security system talk to the DWP system, and I appreciate that might be the stumbling block, but I think it's worth exploring, um, because we know that uh, even with extensive promotional campaigns, you know, our Healthier Wealthier Children programme in GDC showed that people find it really difficult to navigate the social security system and know what they're entitled to. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms McNeil, you wanted a supplementary on that one? <clears throat> yes, I really just, um, from my own understanding, I thought you might be able to just help me with this. So, um, you raised the question of um, immigration status and who might qualify. So, I just wanted to be clear in my head um, what your view of that is. Um, so, in relation to EU nationals, what is your understanding of who would qualify? Is it the residency qualification, the number of years that you've been resident in Scotland? What's... 
there's a number of factors that are brought into play in determining your qualification. You can, uh, if you meet certain criteria, which may be you may be working on a self-employed basis, there's criteria which determines whether that is sufficient to have you entitled to benefits following that. There's criteria around job seeking. There's Again, quite specific rules around that. There's also having lived in the country for five years, which gets you another form of status again. So there's a, there's a few tests which are applied, um, but we do encounter women who, for various reasons, don't meet those tests. They may not have been earning enough money from their self-employed role, for example. That's one particular example that came up on our advice line quite recently. Uh, the woman had been working on a self-employed basis for more than a year, but... Um, for relatively small amounts of money, so she was then considered not to have been meeting the criteria which would have made her eligible under the EU provisions. So there might be quite a number of EU nationals that might not qualify for, although they have been living here. Yeah. Yes, and, and we don't have numbers on that, unfortunately. Um, just secondly, in relation to the to other qualifying criteria, um, so you would qualify if you've... Um, for this benefit, if you've been on any tax credits, including housing benefits, there's a proposal to include universal claimants who had an award in the month before applying, and that's not included in the draft regulations. I mean, given what you said earlier about in, in encapsulating low-paid workers as well as those in benefit, are you sufficiently satisfied that the qualifying criteria would uh, would mean that, that, uh, that women who are also working on, on universal credit would qualify for this grant? I think our think expertise is pregnancy through to the first year, so I'm, I'm not so sure about the return to work uh, provisions for the later second and third payments. But around the time of the birth, the, the issue is um, specifically in relation to maternity allowance and those who are sole parents with no housing costs who are on maternity allowance who are not consequently eligible for universal credit. That's the only group where like, we've identified um, at that point in time we're particularly concerned about. I just find that those, because those on universal credit can be those who are not working and those who are working, but you're, you're satisfied that the eligibility rules as to who qualifies <laughs> is, would cover both groups, those working and not working, but were on low incomes. Uh, well, yes. It's, it, it, I mean, universal credit, is, as you know, is, is set at a very low bar, so there are going to be people not entitled to universal credit who we would consider to be on low incomes, but within the constraints of that, yes, I think it does cover working and non-working. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yes, just on the issue of the month prior to applying and the month applying and the universal credit um, entitlement being greater than zero pounds, I wondered whether we could include anyone who um, was receiving even a zero pound universal credit in that month. And perhaps, again, I'm not understanding the subtlety of that. And the reason that I question it or query it is um, we know that 70% of our children living in relative poverty are in working households. And we also know that precarious employment is increasingly an issue. So I'm concerned about people that might be moving in and out of eligibility for universal credit. And if in a month they've received a zero payment. I presume that's because the next month they might be reconsidered and after so many months of zero they then are exited from the benefit. That's my assumption here. And if that's the case, I think that would allow us to capture another group vulnerable, financially vulnerable. Um, obviously, again, I don't have numbers and the implications of that for the cost of the grant, but it might be something worth exploring. And I'm not sure why it was set at greater than zero. I guess that's what I'm, I'm asking. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Ms. Hamza, did you want to come in no. on that? Okay, that, that, that's um, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Mr. Balfour. <clears throat> Thank you, Good morning, panel. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but I wonder if I could just go back on one point that um, Ms. Scott made in regard to missing people and using the uh, birth, you know, the register of birth as, as a way of doing that. Um, my understanding... And I appreciate just my understanding, is that the first payment can be made before the birth of a child. Maybe Mr Fergie had a comment on this as well. How do we pick up parents not in, who want more money before so they can pay for things before the child is born? Uh, have you, I mean, you, you said, you know, it's difficult. Is that a, a role for health visitors, for other people? I just wonder, how do we then pick people up once they go and see a medical professional 
and are pregnant. Currently, with the Sure Start grant, um, we require um, families to have a health professional signature, but we found that that is a barrier, actually. And you know, I welcome the fact that with the new um, Best Start grant, that won't be needed. And I'm also conscious of uh, the reliance on really hard-pressed frontline staff to be remembering a whole range of things, and um, it, that that doesn't always happen. Having said that. Um, I appreciate that eligibility starts from 24 weeks of pregnancy. We now have across Scotland, um, eight of our 14 health boards have a single IT maternity system, BadgerNet, um, and, if, and it's a dynamic system, so we can, CleverMed are the company that provide the system, and we can make requests on a two-monthly basis for um, updates in that system. <clears throat> so if we so decided that we wanted that system to talk to our social security system and alert the social security system um, once someone reaches 24 weeks of pregnancy, there would then need to be a way of cross-checking that with eligible benefits. And that's why I say it would need to talk to our social security system and possibly the DWP. But that would be the same for the birth register. So we could consider BadgerNet in addition to the birth register, which would pick up uh, the uh, remaining health boards that aren't on BadgerNet, perhaps. And there's now, as I'm sure Gavin will talk to, a, a, an antenatal um, contact with our health visiting colleagues, which is fantastic. Um, and it may be that it's something that could be raised or, or, or signposted by professionals then, but again, that's another request on um, a whole range of things that we're asking health visitors to look at at that um, contact point. The, the problem with health visitors taking part in this at all proactively is capacity. I think there's a, a misconception now that there is this magical 500 ex vis health visitors in the system by next year, uh, and the 40 million pound that went on top of that, um, they can do everything for everybody, and including putting their pants over their tights and flying to the next visit. It just doesn't work like that because they just do not have the capacity because there are more, almost as many leaving the service as we're bringing into the service. We're also very concerned that the interaction that you have with your client uh, and the family becomes much more, I'm going to give you that now, tick that box, I'm going to give you this now, tick that box, rather than building up a therapeutic relationship with that family. And when we're looking at um, a time scale being introduced in some visits and some health boards of 40, 45 minutes, adding another task into that just squashes out perhaps things that will apply to everybody in a universal way. And we have to remember that being a health visitor or being accessed to the health visiting service is a universal benefit. And we have to be cautious as well. Health visiting has always been seen, are you kind of one of those shadowy social work agents of the state? No, we're not. We're health. We're there to empower you in your health decisions and to get healthy outcomes. So we are very wary about more on the workforce and we're very wary about being seen as a, an instrument of the social security system when we're not. Oh, that's very helpful, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, obviously there's a, a role for health and midwives, albeit what you've said, you know, a line for capacity. But I think um, we also have to think that with particularly vulnerable families, often third sector agencies will be in touch with them, and there's a role there. And the other group is, is looking at young parents. They may still be in school or in education. And as Gavin says about health visitors, we expect teachers to do more and more. But, sim but at the same time, I think if you have a pregnant teenager in your class, there is obviously going to be some educational input there. And particularly, you know, we know that educational, the outcomes for children and for parents are so much improved if they can stay on in education. So I think that there is a role for quite a varied range of professions, albeit accepting that they have their own very particular job to do. Um, apologies for wanting to come back in, but that's just sort of triggered something for me. Um, one of the, uh, just to refer again to Healthier Wealthier Children in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, um, the process for that is that we use our universal contact points in health to um, make referrals. So we try to keep the onus on the frontline staff as minimal as possible, but if in the course of their holistic assessment they notice financial difficulty, they can make a referral and, and we would 
through the Badger and, um, maternity system, for example, we're trying to make it as streamlined as possible. It's a case of pressing a button if the family you know, agrees to that referral. <clears throat> and that's where the third sector and other provider organisations can come in. And then, unlike you know, sitting with your health professional and going through your income and your benefit entitlement, you're sitting with someone separate from health, so it kind of overcomes Gavin's concerns. But one of the issues, if I may say, and kind of appeal to the committee, we're finding that investment in those services is decreasing. And I'm about to, in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, launch a big kind of renewal of awareness with our midwives and our health visitors about the New Child Poverty Act and the need to maximise incomes. But I'm very concerned that we're going to generate lots of referrals that we don't have capacity within our local authorities to cater for because of budget um, issues there, which means that financial inclusion services, the budgets for those are being reduced. So that's something that perhaps needs to be considered in terms of support for Best Start grant. And that last point that uh, Sonia made really just highlights the, the, the realities of practice for so many health visitors now is that local authority colleagues have been, are just not there anymore, so they're being expected to do more and they have very, very little capacity. Okay. Two very quick. Is it still on this area? No. Because uh, uh, Miss McGuire wants to come in. Okay. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that, that area of breaking the link um, with accessing other services and kind of look at it from the perspective of um, my constituent, I suppose. The um, committee have done quite a lot of work and we've been focused on increasing uptake and simplifying things and acknowledging everything you say about the, about the pressure on practitioners. Is there a danger that if the onus is on the um, person who's entitled to the benefit and having to evidence contact with another service, that that actually increases the burden on them and might impact on uptake of what they're entitled to? My understanding is that they don't have to evidence their contact with health. I think um, what we're saying is that through contact with perhaps the social security system, they would encourage those that haven't, that aren't in antenatal care. So, so certain groups we know aren't um, often contacting the health professional. That's one of the issues in the health professional signing it. Um, but, but there's no, the, the, to, to access the grant, they don't have to show that they're in contact with health. That's my understanding. To demonstrate that they're enrolling in nursery or they're having contact with another service? No, and my understanding is no. Okay. So that you, you don't actually have to be going to nursery to receive the nursery payment. Okay. Um, that was my reading of the regulations. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Oh. Yeah, I've just got a couple of technical questions, so if you don't want to answer them, just please ignore them. The first one is around kinship arrangements, um, which I think we would all agree is a good thing. and. Uh, from looking at, again, my reading of regulations, there would need to be a formalised agreement for the kingship carers to get the money. Obviously, there's 32 local authorities. Would your suggestion be that there should be a standard agreement between for each local... You know, each local authority has the same documentation that has to be completed, or would you prefer to leave it to each local authority to, to do their own thing in regard to reaching that formal agreement? Uh, do you mean a formal agreement over the kinship care? Yeah. Um, I think Louise, who's going to speak from Celsius afterwards, is more, much more of an expert than, than me on this. I don't have the technicality. I, what I would say is that certainly the organisations that we work with are aware of a great number of kinship carers who are in great hardship and really could do with this payment. I know that the, the government is talking about bringing propo proposals forward this summer about a kinship care allowance. And I do think, I mean, very often we can be subject to a postcode lottery over who gets what. And actually, it seems, you know, if somebody has taken on that burden or that hopefully joy as well, but, you know, really financial burden for their family, that they should be penalised for doing so, or, you know, just because they live five miles apart, there should be a huge discrepancy in their payment. So would your suggestion be that there's an agreement maybe between all local authorities that the same procedure is followed and the same agreements are reached with Scottish Government, rather than each individual local authority doing it, there's a kind of central agreement, maybe with COSLA working it out? As I say, I'm not an expert on these matters, but in terms of the end outcome of having a uniform rate across the country, I would certainly agree with that. Okay. 
That's a bit fascinating. Th thank you, convener. Just on a relating to universal credit that you spoke about earlier, I just had a follow-up question around the maternity allowance. Uh, it's my understanding that some people on maternity allowance will uh, also be uh, qualifying for benefits uh, f for the Best Start grant. Uh, are you aware of how many families, or have you any experience um, of how many families you think might miss out on the Best Start grant because of that? And uh, the anomaly between how maternity allowance interacts with universal credit. Um, I notice you're shaking, uh, you're nodding your head, Sonia, so perhaps. I actually can't answer that. I, I wondered whether Ross could. Beyond my area of expertise as well, but just, if you don't mind me just jumping back to Mr. Balfour's question. From our opinion, um, practitioners appreciate one thing for the whole country. It's not a huge country, it's fairly small. So why do we have a myriad of cutting and slicing, and as one of my colleagues said, the postcode, we are moving towards one pathway in Scotland for health visiting, and it's certainly beneficial to practice. You have families moving in and out of your patch often, and if you have to re-educate them over what happens in your area, which is different from the area they've just come from, it just wastes time. So we would go for a Scottish-wide agreement on that particular subject. Sorry, Mr McPherson, I can't answer your specific no, no, question. No problem. Um, well, I, I can comment on the maternity allowance question. So far as I'm aware, there isn't data that uh, tells us how many women will be in the position I've described of being received of maternity allowance or parents with no housing costs. So I, I can't tell you precisely how many will be affected by that. But as far as we're aware, it's only that group who will be excluded from universal credit and consequently excluded from Best Start grant amongst those who are receiving maternity allowance. Have you had any interaction with the DWP on that point at all in terms of your... Uh, I don't know that the DWP has paid a whole heap of attention to what we've said to them on, on this issue. Um, we certainly... It's our view that that should be changed by the DWP, but um, I can't say we've made any progress on that. Um, it would be our preference to have some provision along the lines of an exceptional circumstances provision in Scotland to be able to accommodate that. I ideally, in the future, that wouldn't be needed, but I think at this point in time, we do have a group of women who, um, many of whom will be uh, very much in need of financial support, who will be excluded from Best Start Grant under this arrangement. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and just uh, related to that, convener, I know um, Polly McNeill's question touched on this in the relationship with universal credit generally, but I wondered if there were any other points you wanted to, to, to add about the, the relationship between the, the Best Start Grant and universal credit and any uh, issues that you think might arise. Well, I think, you know, there's, there's all sorts of problems with universal credit. Our focus is really just on pregnancy in the first year. Um, I think this maternity action one is the one that stood out most strongly for us, um, though I think there's many different families who will receive less money under universal credit than they would have under the previous arrangements. Um, and, but in some ways there is, I think the, the alignment of the Best Start grant with universal credit and other benefits administered by the DWP makes a lot of sense in terms of simplicity, because we certainly have a lot of women calling our advice line who are struggling to work out what their entitlements are and to access them. And there's many others who don't call our advice line because they're not even aware that that support's available. So I think keeping the system as simple as possible with your assessment processes as straightforward as possible um, makes sense. And so aligning with the DWP provisions is, a, is generally a, a positive step. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Um, Ms McNeill, do you want to come in? Oh, I'll bring in... No, I'll bring in Ms Johnson. And, um, thank you. Um, thanks very much for your evidence so far this morning. It's, it's very helpful. Um, I get the impression that we need to simplify matters for those who should be able to access the help that they need when they need it. Um, we have looked previously at the issue of automaticity and you know, just streamlining the system so that it takes up less of the health professional's time, for example. And I'm just wondering if, if you think we need to do more in that regard, because 
you know, the Social Security Agency will know who's claiming benefits. Um, just wondering if we need to be looking at more automatic links. You know, um, we know when someone is born because births are registered. We know when children start school and so on. So should we be using that information to make sure that this is happening more automatically? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Quickly. I think it's possible as well. Okay. I think there's um, the obvious answer is yes. The, the reality is that there is a myriad of systems that the practitioner needs to move through, needs to use, and they don't talk to each other a lot of the time. Uh, Sonia mentioned uh, the budget system, eight health boards, but what about the others? Uh, they're not there yet. There are various systems where you would think it's obvious why don't they talk, uh, but they don't talk rather. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a huge barrier to a practitioner when they have got to duplicate their effort, when they've got to try and jump over that artificial software barrier that's been put in place because one of one agency has that and one agency has this and they just don't speak. Mm -hmm. So anything that can, we can use technology to simplify practice or to assist the practitioner in the practice is to be applauded. But that is a huge uh, task to tackle. But if we can tackle it, everything will be much more efficient and much more effective and make best use of that practitioner time. Mm -hmm. I to also say yes. I mean, I can see that there are huge IT difficulties. And I suppose the other issue that I would flag up is that there's a potential for simplification to flag up people, but there are also groups of really vulnerable parents. And again, as I suppose I'm flagging back or going back to young parents, but also to parents with learning disabilities. And I think that those kind of groups of parents actually need the relationship and they may need the relationship both in terms of support but also in terms of advocacy and help to, to move forward and get the grant. Um, I'd, I'd add that certainly we find there are a lot of very vulnerable women who struggle to work out what their entitlements are, vulnerable families who struggle to sort that out, but also some who aren't vulnerable who are simply dealing with the mm. challenges of pregnancy and new parenthood. So uh, certainly our view is it makes most sense to have multiple points at which uh, parents are told about the, their entitlements mm -hmm. in the hopes that it, at one point they'll pick up on it and be able to act on it. Because it may well be that having that information, even at a critical time, is just not enough to get, get the message through. Mm -hmm. Windows of opportunity around um, systems talking to each other. I've mentioned Badger Net Gavin quite rightly points out it doesn't cover all of our health boards. We also have the new Scottish um, child surveillance and wellbeing system, so it's replacing our old child health surveillance preschool system. And every child should be um, on that um, because we call children for vaccinations, uh, so we should have every birth on that. So there are a couple of health systems which are currently in development that if we specify that they should talk to our social security system, and in developing our social security system that it should be talk to the DWP system once their functionality becomes available, if it ever does, then at least we're set up for it in the future. So let's not miss these windows of opportunity to have them, um, the systems talking to each other, so that we may not be currently ready, but at some point in the future we are to achieve what Gavin has kind of outlined in terms of a smooth, streamlined IT approach. Okay. Can I just ask, I mean, I suppose being on a low income and claiming low... And, and, and claiming low-income benefits. You know, you may be on a very low income and not claiming anything, which then means that you might be excluded from, from Best Start. Um, so I just wonder if you've got any concerns around the eligibility criteria. You know, are we going to be able to ensure that everyone who needs to access it does? I think inevitably there'll be a group that will just be over the threshold for benefits who will still be struggling to um, you know, meet their everyday costs and who would benefit from the grant. Um, I'm not sure how to extend the eligibility beyond, other than you know, the, the exceptions that we've kind of outlined, um, how to go a sort of extra step without it being universal. Um, Add to Sonia's point, something that said, Sonia said earlier about the financial inclusion services, which are absolutely key in ensuring that people know about and take up their benefits. 
And as she said, the money for those services is falling. So I think it's, it, it's about making sure that people get those checks and know if they're eligible. And as you say, there will be some people who may be eligible and don't take up and are a low income. And it, I would agree it's really difficult because you have to have some way of saying who's eligible and as far as possible, you don't want people to fall through the net. But at the minute, that is on existing benefits, and it's difficult to see another way of doing it. Mm -hmm. An income threshold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess you could um, say we won't make it about passported benefits. We'll say that people earning under the median income, that would be a significant increase in the number of people eligible. And I guess we've got to think about the affordability of that and the opportunity cost of that against other things that we could... Um, maybe do I'm not I mean I, I would love that and I would love it if you just taxed me more to and people like me more to do that but um yes leave it at that <coughs> on this area or um, it, new it was area? something else yeah, I'm just going to bring in Mr McPherson who's got supplementary just, just very quickly I think that the the points that you're all making there about encouraging take-up are so important and I, I wondered if uh, on that basis that you would welcome the fact that the piece of legislation, primary legislation, includes that uh, obligation for the, the agency to, to promote take-up and, and, and how important do you see that being in, in making sure that we deliver this to the, all the people who need it? Yes, absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's a welcome change to much of what we're dealing with in relation to benefits and the DWP to see this focus on ac promoting access. I think it's fantastic. The, um, the extended timeframes for application are quite important. The removal of the requirement for a health professional to sign a form to get the initial payment. There's a number of specific measures which are, I think, very helpful in promoting access, but the overall principle of promoting access is, is a very welcome change. Mm. Thank you. I would totally agree. Um, and I didn't say at the beginning of this session I should have done that I very much welcome the grant. I see it making a big difference to a lot of people that we work with. And I think on, a, you know, on the wider issue of social security and the bill itself, the, you know, the fact that it's based on respect, trust, dignity and so on, it's absolutely fantastic. And you know, really have seen the impact of some of the ways that sometimes the DWP can work in terms of sanctions, in terms of behaviour to people, and really hope that what we are seeing currently about the new Social Security Act in Scotland will come to pass, and that people will be treated with fairness and dignity, because very often, I mean, I've, I've brought some case studies along from people that may have been helped and that have not been helped by the current system, and we really need to do better. I mean, it's, it's not helping people either with income and outcomes for their children or of even getting out of that system. So I really welcome a system that is going to hopefully be more enabling and empowering for people. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. Remove the stigma that is attached at the moment uh, would be extremely useful. Uh, it's not life-changing but it certainly has an impact on life the the sums that are being mentioned and anything that can assist that family to bring up their child and to remove that child from poverty will have huge incomes for society uh, sorry huge benefits for society as that child develops and grows uh, whether it be their demand on education systems on health systems or even criminal justice systems the research is well documented now and so anything we can do to change little johnny from being maybe going down something that is less beneficial for him into a more positive life and a positive lifestyle is to be applauded and to be supported. Yes, and I would echo everything that's already been said. I think it's fantastic that there's a, a, a provision for promoting eligibility to the service and the whole values that have been laid out um, for the new social security system, I think, are also wonderful. We seem to have moved away from the idea of social insurance. This was an insurance policy. This is Most of the people who are eligible for these benefits are moving in and out of work. It's a myth that there's generations of unemployed. <coughs> when the Joseph Rowntree Foundation have looked at that, that just isn't so. People move in and out of work, they pay taxes, and this is their insurance policy and I think it's fantastic that that's the sort of message this new system is going to give out and I think when we do give out that message people respond to it and they rise to that sort of message. Thank you. Mr Linter. 
Th thank you, convener. And I think this is a point that uh, Claire Simpson touched on um, earlier. And I think your point was a simple one, which is not a criticism. Simple points can sometimes be the best points. And it was about the, the difference between the age of 16 and 18 and taking 16 as the age at which I think direct payments should be made in certain circumstances. Uh, and you give an example of why that is. People are allowed at the age of 16 to marry, which is nothing new in Scotland. It's been the way for hundreds of years. They can vote at 16 certain elections now and so forth. Um, and I suppose my question that follows on from that is, uh, do you or other members of the panel see any difficulties in terms of the way the system is set up or indeed how this would interact with other um, benefits in, in, the, in the system or otherwise with the D, DWP systems? Um, on some of the technicalities, I can't answer you, but it does allow me the opportunity to say something else, which is about the under-18s and the under-20s and, you know, the kind of age categories that we put on things. So under-18s are automatically eligible and those who are 18, 19 are not and have to rely on the qualifying benefit. And when I was writing my evidence, I puzzled quite a lot over that bit of 18, 19 and that you could be possibly 17 or 18 and automatically entitled to a grant, but at 18, 19 you were not and would have to rely on your parent and the passport and benefit. I wondered about the affordability of that. I wondered about who that would be. And I, you know, I didn't put it in the evidence because I didn't have it then. <laughs> but thinking about it since, I mean, it is those people, probably the 18, 19 year olds, who are living at home with parents, who are maybe studying, who are not in receipt of other benefits. Those kind of people are likely to be, not always, but possibly studying or possibly training. If they become pregnant during that time, it's very hard. I can really testify to that. My son and daughter-in-law are in that position, albeit a bit older at the minute. It's not an easy thing to do. If we extend that automatic entitlement to under 20s, I think it makes it a great deal simpler to administer. It treats people as adults, as they should be treated, and past the age of 20, they're not dependents and can't be treated as dependents by the DWP. And when I looked at what the figures were, in 2016, 1,449 children were born to parents between 18 and 20. And those figures, when looked at them as well, have been declining year on year. Some of those people anyway are going to be getting money through universal, you know, will, will qualify through a benefit, through child tax credits, through universal credit on their own. It will be a relatively small group, but it will be a group to who I think need the money and who it could make a difference to. And that difference could be, you know, paying some childcare costs very early on. It could be buying a product, <laughs> whatever it is. I think it simplifies the system and I think it catches a group that we currently don't catch. That doesn't really answer your question, does it? Yeah, it perhaps um, highlights some of the possible complications that might arise from a simplistic uh, approach or the approach I suggest. I wonder if any other members of the panel comment on that area in terms of these age differentials. That are, that are applied? Uh, uh, there are technical issues that arise mm -hmm. with that, but unfortunately I can't speak to them right. today. Okay. Right, thank you. Uh, can I bring Ms McNeil in? It, thank you. I, I appreciate some of this is already covered, but I just wanted to be sure about the uh, responsibility for a child and who can apply. Um, so, as you know, only the person responsible for the child will be able to apply for the Best Direct Grant, but there's been two suggested approaches. They decide parental responsibility, uh, and both use the receipt of reserve benefits as part of the test, but the test is yet to be finalised, which is why I'm interested in your view. Um, so, the test in the draft regulation excludes, for example, all looked after children. Uh, the consultation document seems to assume that all looked after children are financially supported by local authorities. But we know that's not necessarily the case because some looked after children uh, are living at home with their parents. It might be some of that age group that you were talking about in response to Gordon Lindhurst. Um, just wanted to, um, you've covered the question of age 
and I think you did talk about kinship carers. So I just wanted to be clear about your view about who should be able to apply for a Best Start grant, who would qualify um, as having parental responsibility. If there's anything else you wanted to add to what's been said already. Um, the agencies that we work with who will be responding to the consultation have all said that test two is the one that they prefer, really because it enables the widest reach and uh, will include uh, as many people as possible. The issue of kinship care is very specific and very technical, and I think we it will be, I think that kinship carers in receipt of formal allowance will be able to get it, informal may not, but also children who are looked after, I mean, in Scotland, we have children who are looked after at home as a special category. I think they also, under what's proposed, would be allowed to get it because otherwise it's when the child is looked after, but the local authority would be expected to pay for certain things. So I hope that, I mean, I think there's an amount of refinement of the regulations still to be done, and I know that civil servants are working on this in this area, but I think that we would certainly, we would go for whichever test allowed the widest reach, and in our view, that's test two. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions for the panel this morning? Um, can I, I thank you very much for your attendance this morning. I'm sure um, a lot of interesting areas raised, some of which I've actually written to the Cabinet Secretary about, so I'm um, interested to hear them raised today. But thank you much, very much for your time this morning, and we'll suspend shortly while the panels swap over.
Uh, good morning. We move on to our second panel this morning. I would like to welcome to committee Dr Louise Hill, Policy Implementation Lead at the Centre for Excellence for Looked After Children, Celsius. Uh, Mark Willis, Welfare Rights Worker, Early Years Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland. And um, I again would like to just open with a question of... of Obviously, we're at the developing stages of the of the regulations for Best Start Grant. Whether you, you see there are big gaps in what's proposed at the moment, I'll go to Dr. Hill first. <laughs> thank you. It's time to be Louise, but um, thank you very much, and um, thank you for the opportunity to come and meet with you today and to discuss this issue. Um, we really welcome the Best Start Grant, and in particular, the the extension, the financial um, increases are very substantial particularly for our early years children and preschool. We think it's um, a great development. We also really recognise and value the approach, as the other panel members have said, towards a, a new kind of social security system for Scotland and being value-based and rights-based with a, an emphasis on trust and dignity at its heart. So we really welcome that. Um, I should also say we've been really impressed by the... Um, social security team in the in the civil service in their um, engagement i participated in a consultation event last week and it was incredibly well attended by all kinds of different groups um, really good representation from third sector and from health in particular and i think what was what felt different perhaps about that kind of event was that it really was a genuine dialogue around that these are um, some of the challenges that we might face and really wanted to hear the solutions so there was some really positive energy in the room and there was a real openness to listen to to the solutions so um, just to say that from the start um, in terms of some of the gaps um, and I can speak to it in in greater depth but there is a specific issue that we have for looked after children and young people in the illustrative regs as you may be aware there is an exemption of looked after children um, and that. I think as part of the development was not actually the, the intention and perhaps that's helpful why there are only illustrative regulations at this stage because there is a recognition that for we have um, a sizable number of looked after children that would be at home so in terms of our under fives at the moment in the last year it would be 768 children are under five and looked after at home with their birth parents um, but there's also a, a a significant number of children, obviously, that are looked after in kinship care in Scotland. So it's about 28% of all of our looked after children. So it's just over about 4,000 children at the moment. And, of course, having that exemption of looked after children um, would mean that um, that group that we would absolutely recognise could um, be in need of additional support, partly because we know that children that grow up in kinship care um, live in some of our poorest communities in Scotland. The analysis of the last census data clearly shows us this. Um, it's an, often an older group of kinship carers and it would be um, a group that are disproportionately affected by um, disability and ill health. So there's many factors to take into account for that group. So I can talk in greater depth about the kinship care issue for you. Um, and the other area that I'd particularly like to raise is around an assumption of entitlement for care leavers. Um, I think that we can make particular links with the Scottish Care Leavers Covenant and the um, emphasis that we should have as corporate parents and the duties that we have under the Part 9 of the 2014 Act um, for Children and Young People, that we should be very clearly doing everything we can to ensure all of our care leavers access um, all the right kinds of support services, and that includes a social security service and I think what's important around that, sorry, social security system, I think what's important around that is that we know that our care leavers are disproportionately high users of social security so they are overrepresented in the system so that's another area that I'd be really keen to to talk about as well. thank, thank you, you. Uh, Mr Willis thanks very much and thanks for inviting us along um, again we'd like to welcome the best start grant as a positive step in a, a step in tackling poverty and supporting families uh, with young children and compared to the Sure Start Maternity Grant, we'd see it as a clear improvement mm -hmm. um, in the ways that has been mentioned, increasing it and allowing payments for subsequent children. Um, that will make a big difference to families. So in terms of the gaps, such as they are, some of them have been mentioned already. I mean, I, I would put it maybe the gaps will perhaps emerge as a result of a change in context in social security, because mm -hmm. the starting point, if you say, 
any child tax credit, that pretty much does capture all low-income families, I would say. Um, but moving to saying any universal credit, I mean, that's, again, the best you can say. It's good that there isn't an income threshold there, but there are differences in the way that um, universal credit treats unearned income in particular. And that will mean that fa um, individuals or, or families, in some cases, who would have got child tax credit won't get universal credit. So that, that comparison moving forward as universal credit is introduced will mean there'll be families who are on low incomes who miss out. Um, is it easy to identify or capture them? That it, it's, it's, it might not be that simple, but th that, that yeah, is what we'd see as a gap, I would say. And then the other things that have been mentioned already around kinship care and some questions about habitual residence and, and the, the questions about young people as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to bring in Mr. Balfour. Thanks. Um, good morning, uh, panel. And I think this is probably aimed at you, Dr. Hill, in regard to kinship arrangements. Um, my understanding is that kinship carers will get a payment if they enter into a formal agreement. And if, that, if I'm right, Matt, perhaps you could give me a comment on that. And if that's right, should that formal agreement be standardised across Scotland so that it's not decided by each local authority or each agency, but it's a standard. So if you move around the country, there's no kind of differences. And, and secondly, uh, those who are fostering don't, aren't entitled to this, they seem to be excluded, who are fostering children. Do you think they should be included mm. in that um, as well? Because um, obviously adoptive parents are fine because they are legal for children, well, and, and, but I'd be interested around um, people that foster yeah. and also around um, issues around um, kingship. I mean, I've got one other question I'll come back to in a moment. Okay. Um, thank you. It's a good question. And um, I think it's, if it's just helpful, can I just maybe kind of set out a little bit about how kinship is at the moment in, in Scotland? And it's quite useful perhaps to think that we kind of have three broad groups of um, children that live in a kinship care arrangement. We have a group of children, which is the, the just over 4,000 that I said, which are children who are formally looked after children. Um, and as the Best Start grant, as the regulations currently stand, um, this group of children would not be eligible for the Best Start grant. Then you also have um, a group of children who are not looked after children, but under... Um, the Section 11 order of the 95 Act, which was um, considered a kinship care order in the 2014 Act. Um, so they're not looked after children, and they, if they have this order in place, um, they would be eligible for the kinship care grant. Now, some of the... So in terms of the um, allowances question for kinship carers, if this group of children are deemed to be at risk of becoming looked after or were previously looked after children, the local authority would provide an allowance um, to that family based on an assessment. So not all families that have a kinship care order get the allowance from a local authority. Um, so it can be quite a confusing field. And then you also have a much, much bigger group of kinship carers. Um, we estimate, well, around 12,000 in the last census figures, and these are our informal kinship carers that there could be um, no knowledge at all of um, social work services, of those arrangements. And we consider these to be private family arrangements that are made. Now, interesting from a research point of view, um, although there's actually been relatively little research conducted in Scotland on kinship care, but taken from the kind of UK evidence base and the international studies show that the actual adversities that children face um, means that they actually have very similar backgrounds, whether or not they end up in informal kinship care or formal kinship care. So those kinds of factors are um, experience of living with parents who perhaps have um, serious drug and alcohol problems, mental health difficulties. Um, disproportionately represented is a group which Claire mentioned earlier is parents with learning disabilities um, are much highly kind of represented in terms of informal kinship care. So the children might live with a grandparent, for example. Um, and you also have um, bereavement being obviously a factor. So you, so you have three quite distinct groups of children. Um, but actually, if we just talk to the children themselves and did our work with them kids, they're actually pretty similar <laughs> in terms of what their backgrounds and what their support needs could be considered to be. 
So as it stands at the moment, the looked after children would be excluded. The ones on a kinship care order are included and the, the, the children that are in informal kinship care, if there was a court order, um, so they were kind of demonstrating that, that they then would be included and be able to have the best start grant. But as I presented in the written submission, the challenge is getting a court order and getting a transfer of parental rights and responsibilities is actually pretty difficult and challenging um, for many families. Now, in some ways, some things went in the 2014 Act to try and alleviate this, so there's a provision of support for um, legal support um, from a local authority in certain circumstances for certain eligibility to help get an order. But it's more about the, I suppose, the cultural factors and the barriers that families um, face that many, for example, grandparents don't want to take their children to court to get that transfer of parental rights and responsibilities. They also often don't want to have the, um, although they, are, they should be entitled to child benefit, they actually, the family dynamics can be so fraught and difficult for these families that actually going through the process to get the transfer of child benefit is really difficult. So often that, that doesn't happen, so that can be a real challenge for the qualifying benefit. Um, and actually getting, you know, getting it through the court order is obviously a long process, really difficult, and, and has all kinds of other factors that come into play, so in terms of getting that order. Um, so... I mean, I think you've highlighted the issues... Um, I suppose, as a committee, the simplistic question back is, what's the solution? Yeah, sure. Well, for us, test, test two, um, as presented, would, would have a greater opportunity to reach some of those informal kinship carers. So we would strongly advocate for test two, with the acknowledgement, and as Mark has said, as the system evolves, we'll realise which groups of children we're not, we're not able to reach. Um, the question of whether or not children in foster care should have the el should be eligible for Best Start grant, I think that that would be an interesting area to discuss in much greater depth with um, the foster care um, agencies and the support networks and the memberships. Because I actually don't know what the views of foster carers would be, and I'd be really interested on what their what their views would be. Um, and just to make a a final point in terms of the. Um, the eligibility issues and why we really welcome the, the Best Start grant. But for kinship care in particular, we've, we've got to recognise that the, the likelihood is that children um, would not be, not be accessed at, terms of, at maternity stage. So we have to do a real concerted effort for children at early years and at preschool because those children are likely to have moved into informal or formal kinship or fostering. At that stage, a fairly, fairly small number would be intended to move at, at birth, if that makes sense. So, Sorry. You've laid out um, the complexities of kinship care very well and the complexities and the reasons why families don't want to go down formal routes and all, all the rest of it. So um, we will never know what the extent of all kinship and formal arrangements are, but, but are, are you, um, is it reasonable to say that there are kinship arrangements known to a local authority where there's no formalisation in place but it's known that it's a kinship care relationship? Um, yeah, I think that will vary across different local authorities but there will be because there can be a provision of um, support and they will have had some, potentially have some contact around the needs of a child. Um, there might be a question though that because this is specifically focused on, our, on, on early years and under five, that we know sometimes for some of the challenges of kinship carers that they don't actually arise and become more difficult, should we say, until children are more primary school age. And that's when some more challenges arise in family dynamics where that might be when they contact the social work as well. So we probably need to be mindful of that. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. McNeil. You had a supplementary. Um, yep. Sorry. I because, again, in regard to the informal kinship agreements, um, the, 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 the person who got the first payment would still get the second and third payments. It just wouldn't go to the grandparents or to whoever's looking after them. So the money would still be going from the pot to an individual. It just would be going to the wrong individual. Is, is that what you're saying? Um. I think if, if the parental rights and responsibilities are retained by the parent, yes, but it's not an automated system, so they would have to, my understanding is that they would have to apply for it still through the process, so you could argue that it's pretty unlikely that they would apply when they no longer have care of the, the child. Okay. Um, okay. Ms McNeil? 
Sorry. It was just a point of clarification. I think you did say this. I just wanted to be clear. And I know, um, I think I've got most of it. So, so, so the scenario where grandparents have effective parental responsibility as a result of, say, a bereavement, where the court has said the, ch the children reside with you. Um, w what did you say about that in relation to the, the, the eligibility? Yeah, they would be eligible because they they've eligible. got parental rights and responsibilities and would demonstrate that through because an order. Because of the court order. Right, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, Ms McNeill, will bring you in on a new area. No, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Have you got a supplementary in the previous area? To the opening bit? Hmm? Well, I don't know. It's quite a small... Yeah, on you go. I don't on you go. <laughs> I'll jump in anyway. Good morning, Vanna. Um, I wanted to ask you about, about young parents. We've got written evidence there, and you both mentioned it in your in your opening statements. Just for the record, I mean, I think it, intuitively I would say that it would seem silly to not give the parents of children who are responsible for bringing up the children the, the support that we would give to older our parents. But if you would just flesh out a bit why that's important um, for the record. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I think the issues, um, as, as I see it in the draft regulations, is the 16, 17-year-old is automatically entitled to can claim in their own right. I think the intention is a mother under 16, someone always would be the appointee. Um, so then it's 18, 19-year-olds. They do have an option, but it's, quite, it's complicated. They could start claiming when they're responsible for a child. They could start claiming universal credit, as it will be in their own right, and then they would be eligible. But in some cases, they could be worse off doing that uh, as a household rather than staying as part of their, the baby's grandmother's um, claim, say. Um, plus, there's issues about if they're in education and so on, and, and the idea of, yeah, supporting them uh, to stay in education, perhaps, and, uh, and how student income, as I said, is treated for universal credit. There could be differences there. So. Um, that 18, 19 year old, in, in some cases, yeah, would, would have to be relying on the grandmother to be making the claim for them and then give, giving them the money, which, yeah, doesn't seem ideal in terms of supporting the young parent to, you know, be the responsible one for the child. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, as has been suggested, one way around that would be to say under 20s are automatically eligible regardless of income. And I think realistically, 18, how many 18, 19 year olds wouldn't be eligible anyway, mm -hmm. it, you know, through, either through their parents or through um, claiming the benefits in their own right. I think it's quite unlikely that a, an 18, 19 year old with a baby, again, you, you know, you could put in a rule that it was, if they had a partner, the partner was also under 20 or something like that. So it's unlikely that they've, they've got some huge other income that would prevent them being eligible anyway. This is just, a, it would be a simplification, a shortcut. and. Yeah, as I said, there's nothing really special about the, the age 18 in terms of the benefit rules. It's not necessarily significant in, in some ways, I think. I suppose we wouldn't want to make sweeping generalisations about um, 18 or 19 year olds. There, there may be people who are working and, and who have children, but I, I take on yeah. board your point, yeah. Can I just ask a, a supplementary on, on that area? Because students were mentioned earlier in the previous panel um, and Entitlement to student bursaries was brought up as a possible. Do you, do you think EMA should be considered as well as a possible gateway to this grant? Possibly. Um, I think there that that young person who's getting an EMA is likely to be, they'd be a dependent young person, and so they're likely to be, yeah, again, part of someone else's claim, I suppose. Um, and yeah, again, with EMA, there is an income threshold that checks the household income. So yeah, so that would be an effective way of identifying a, a low-income student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just, just, mm -hmm. yeah, just, just uh, I suppose if I can add on the the young parents at the consultation event that I was at, I was really there was a very um, powerful contribution made by um, someone at the next table to me around the. Um, just the, the challenge for some of our families, um, some of the young people that are experiencing just so much adversity. The, the level um, of which they're moving around and what their very complicated relationships with their parents could be. So she was very concerned if the payment went to Gran, um, that A, whether or not that money would ever be passed on um, to the, for the grandchild. Um, 
also just what a factor that might be in terms of their, their relationship. Um, she also gave lots of examples of um, uh, the young women being um, basically asked to leave the family home when they were pregnant as a result of the pregnancy. But it, that doesn't mean necessarily that they are going to stop check stop claiming for the child benefit. <laughs> so, you know, like, I think it really struck me that the, the complexity, and in some ways, that this is exactly the group of, of new young parents that you absolutely want to be supporting and to stop that, that risk of children growing up in poverty, you know? So it, it kind of means that I think we need to be so mindful of this group. Would you have a view on how that should be solved? Would you agree that I would, it should I would, be everybody under 20 here. I, I would agree that that seems to me to be a simpler system. What I would say that heartened in terms of what the um, communication strategy and things is around the social security agency, but the recognition of the local presence and particular awareness of some of the issues that are facing young people and particularly obviously for us care leavers, because for care leavers that's a whole different group in terms of what their relationship would be with their parents. So a number of looked after children and people, quite a significant proportion actually do return to their family biological home and then might go on to have children themselves. So again, complicated relationships, but in terms of the local presence, I think there should be something very specific in terms of support for the under 20s that's tailored for that group and also recognition of just some of the complexity of their lives and how the money can be used to kind of help them kind of navigate some of it. Thank you, that's helpful. Mr. McPherson, you wanted to... Uh, yes, please. Th thank you, Camira. Good morning. Uh, I just had some questions around the qualifying benefits. Uh, again, uh, I note particularly, uh, Mr. Willis, in CPAG's uh, submission at the end, you say that you believe the maternity allowance should be added as a qualifying benefit uh, where the claimant does not have a partner. Could you just elaborate on that? Um, well, yeah, as, as, as we've said, maternity allowance, it's not means-tested, so... Yeah, I understand that there's difficulties about adding it as a qualifying benefit, but the basic criteria is that you've, you, you haven't worked either long enough for the same employer or earned enough to get statutory maternity pay. So that, that's the criteria. So it's paid to women in the maternity period just for 39 weeks. Um, and the most it can be paid at is about £145 a week, which actually works out just slightly more than the amount for one person and a child under universal credit. So it means, basically, if they had a partner and were on a low income, then they'd get universal credit anyway if maternity allowance was, was their only income. So if you're going to include maternity allowance, I suppose you'd want to add something just to then exclude people who had a partner who had a high income, basically. So you, you are cognizant of that point around it not being means tested and the exactly, fact that it yeah. could well just um, well, sorry, rephrase that that it could uh, mean that people with higher incomes are, are exactly it's, it's not perfect so it could yeah open the door to some people some women who have changed jobs or are self-employed yeah who have a relatively high income but I think the greater concern is that it's it's those women who previously would have been eligible if their only income is maternity allowance they would get child tax credit in full because maternity allowance is ignored for child tax credit but they won't get universal credit because it counts as income in full so it's it's universe it's bridging a flaw in universal credit that you're you could you're yeah i mean you could look at it like that but it's essentially it's it's identifying a, a gap where low income parents are, are, are not going to be eligible for the best start grant and is there any way to identify them. You could even look at um, council tax reduction as another way of identifying that group. Um, that would help if they were um, liable for council tax, so that means living away, for, you know, living on their own. So again, it wouldn't capture uh, women who are still at home, uh, say, in a, in a wider family, or it, and it wouldn't capture students because they'd be, uh, uh, it, they're not liable for council tax anyway. So, um, maternity allowance, yeah, with that proviso, again, as, as Ros was saying, perhaps something in guidance about exceptional circumstances, but I know you don't want to add another income test on top that you have to carry out in order to qualify for the best start grant. So. For simplicity, yeah, maternity allowance. If it's your only income, you don't have a partner. 
that, that would be one way of identifying that group. With, with the caveats, as you, as you suggest. Yeah, yeah. But again, because the numbers are so small, I think, as we say, 700 to 1,000 in Scotland each year claiming it. The majority of whom, if they're liable for rent, then they're going to be eligible via universal credit anyway. If they have a partner and they're on a low income, they'll be eligible via universal credit anyway. So it's just that, that small group within a group. And as I say, because it is paid to, yeah, insecure, low paid work in the main, most of them will be on a low income. But yeah, acknowledging there could be some on higher incomes. Okay, Th thanks for um, just yep, coming, um, related, if that's okay. Um, just as, similar, well, related to that point, are there any other areas around universal credit's relationship with the, uh, Best start grant in um, particular in the earnings fluctuations and how how they would be treated that either of you would like to to comment on. Okay. Um, yeah, I I think there's a slight um, issue. I think there's there's a suggestion in the um, in the paper there that it, the, the using the phrase universal credit at more than zero per month um, at a rate more than than zero. Pounds. Um, I understand why that's been added there because of the fluctuating earnings and so on, but I think just using the phrase entitled to universal credit would be simpler. And the, the concern I have is that it is possible someone could be sanctioned and end up with zero, mm -hmm. even though they are still technically entitled to universal credit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was a slight concern about that phrase. And I think. Again, I think it depends on how the systems work in terms of talking to each other and what you can see. But I think, you know, technically each month, each monthly assessment period for universal credit, if your income is too high and the amount is zero, then you're not actually entitled to universal credit. And you do technically have to start a new claim the following month. So if that is easy to detect from the systems, then that would be one way of doing it. But um, Another way would be to say you were entitled to universal credit in uh, yeah, either the current or the previous assessment period or the one, even the one before that, you could go back three months. That would be another way of doing it, which is the way, uh, for example, I think Healthy Start and Free School Meals in England look at um, universal credit in a, perhaps over three assessment periods is another way of doing it. To create that security in, in case there's a sanction? Um, well, uh, yeah, I think it, in terms of the sanction, I think it's just in terms of the, that would be the, f the phrasing that you use. If, you, if you're sanctioned, you're still entitled to universal credit. So I think if you use entitled to universal credit, that would be okay. Um, if you want to deal with the other issue, the fluctuating earnings and the people who, for example, have two pay packets in one monthly assessment period and that can take them off universal credit for that month. If you have a system that looks back over the previous month as well, then if, as long as they were entitled in that month and you could even go back to the one before that, that then that will, will capture those ones who have just missed out perhaps on because of one month's earnings being too high. Um, or yeah, we could, again, it's, it's a role that the Social Security Agency, if it has, um, built-in advice that you could divide well, a claim again the next month, that would be another way of doing it, as long as they were still within the time period for claiming. Um, so there's, there's possibly ways to deal with the, the issue of fluctuating earnings and universal credit. Dr. Hill, please come on. Just if I can add, add into that, it's, it's a slightly different angle, but the rollout of universal credit presents some very particular challenges for looked after children and young people and their carers because, because really it's conceptualised much more under kind of the English system. So um, kinship carers in England are assessed along a very similar line to a foster carer, so they're seen as equivalent to, to a foster carer. So looked after children are excluded. Um, so it creates a particular challenge for um, the, the kind of child element part of whether or not kinship carers could, could access that in Scotland. So it's a little bit 
Bessie, and I know we, you know, the, with CPAG have a lot more kind of reflections and things on that, and have done some really good work on it. But it's certainly going to present some more challenges if that's if the child element of universal credit is seen as a passporting um, benefit to get the Best Start grant. That that will be a particular challenge for the for the looked after children in kinship care. Thank you both. Please. Thanks. Go and bring in Miss McNeil. Um, Okay. Uh, Ms Johnson, you had a question? Um, yes, thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Um, I'd just like to ask um, your views on the awareness of, well, Sure Start currently, Best Start, um, amongst both professionals and claimants. Is, is, is it as good as it needs to be? What more do we need to be doing to increase awareness that, that this exists? I think um, from what's known from some of the research, a really um, low awareness amongst particular groups, and I know it's been raised as a particular issue for care leavers. Um, so I think that that's why it's absolutely critical, the kind of local presence of the social security kind of agency around general entitlement to benefits. There's many additional barriers, I think, that some of our young people face in terms of having access with anything that's like a, a formal kind of process. So I think there needs to be a really concerted effort, should we say, to ensure that um, all of our young people kind of are able to access this in our young adults. Um, but I think there has been a low take up of particular groups, so we need to learn from that. What's happened with the Sure Start Maternity Grant? Um, but Mark might have more reflections. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the awareness among health professionals is good in terms of it being part of the support in pregnancy and following on from the healthy start. A lot of work's been done in, in health professionals being aware of it, but even then I think there is certainly issues currently with take up uh, among working families because it, it's different from healthy start in that respect. And, and you can still get the Sure Start Maternity Grant if you get basically any tax credits is the rule at the moment, but people often misunderstand that and they think if they're getting working tax credit, they're not eligible. But if they've got a child, they'll be getting child tax credit as well and they, they are eligible. But I'm pretty sure, I looked at some of the statistics that the numbers um, who get the Sure Start Maternity Grant who are in work are, are quite lower than you would expect. And just from training and uh, our advice line, people just don't realize that yeah, if you're, if you're in work and getting tax credits, you could actually get a Sure Start Maternity Grant. Um, so that's a current problem. Moving forward, it will be most cases, it will be universal credit we'll be looking at there. So maybe the message is simpler. Any universal credit, you'll be eligible for the, sure, for the Best Start Grant, avoiding the confusion between child tax credit and working tax credit, perhaps. But certainly work to be done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. C can I ask your views on the issue of the cutout, the cut-off points for claiming the the three elements of Best Start grant? Um, you know, the draft reg regulations propose a longer period in which the three elements of Best Start grant can be claimed. Just like to understand, um, yeah, how you feel about those cut-off points. Um, I can. I mean, again, because it's a new. Thing, uh, for, the, for the nursery payment and the school payment, it's, it seems like a good idea. And yeah, I understand there's a need for, and it makes sense to link it to those stages in the child's life, so I understand that. And generally speaking, with claiming anything, if, if there's a very limited window, then p people are going to miss out. And these are, you know, the nursery one is 18 months and you know, I think about a year for the school one, so that seems quite good. And that gives quite a good opportunity for the for low-income families to get advice, to hear about it, to make the application, and so on. Um, I think the only particular concern I had around applications and and the, and the application windows was what if, at the time you claim, you're not getting a qualifying benefit, and that's gone to appeal, and that can take months and months to get sorted out, and that's eventually, uh, you know, the appeal successful, and that's ex eventually paid and backdated for that period. Are you, are you gonna make, is there a way of making sure that person does get the best start grant payments for in, in that situation? I think that was my slight concern. Yeah, so while you appreciate the, the, the longer window, there still needs to be an element of flexibility for an individual circumstance. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a safeguard. Yeah. I agree with Mark. I think the extension of the window compared to what it was for the Sure Start grant is really welcome. Um, 
I think particularly when we're thinking about the complexities for, for kinship carers, um, the longer the window that can be, the, the better, because they just, they're just facing so many things, so many factors, you know, and it's so hard looking after young children on so many levels for them. So you, you feel that that's, that's a really positive thing. I think the, the timescales that are suggested around the kind of redress um, are, are fairly short in the, in the papers at the moment, what are being consulted on, and I think that, that we would think that it might be wiser to extend that period so that um, if you are not happy with the decision, obviously you have a longer period of time I think it's suggested as, is it 15 working days? Or It's quite a short period at the moment, and that, to me, felt that that might be quite a quick turnaround, expecting people to, to respond, particularly given, you know, what's going on in their lives at that, at that time. OK, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mr Balfour, you had some... Um, thank you. Just um, a very kind of, well, interesting area, if you've got multiple children, I don't know if you've looked at this at all, um, you obviously get a multiple birth supplement, but we don't get the multiple supplement for the other two payments, as far as I can see. Do you, yep, sure. Have I read that correctly? And if so, do you think that needs to be just looked at by when the new regulations are, are produced? Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was having a look at that, and I, I, it hadn't struck me as being an issue, to be honest, because um, the issue is with the birth payment. It's 600 essentially for the first child and 300 for subsequent children, but then an, an extra multiple payment yeah. uh, for a multiple birth. But then the school, the nursery and school payments, that's always going to be 250 just per child, as I understand it. So even in a multiple birth, it will still be per child. Yeah, Although, I mean, I can say also, I think the point is that families with uh, multiple births have extra yeah, needs yeah. And, and so on. So it, it maybe could be given some consideration, but yeah, I, I hadn't, hadn't struck me. Okay. But there is a question, isn't there, around the, um, the whether or not the, there is already a child in, in the family and whether or not that's considered to be there. So I was thinking about that in terms of like adoption in mm. particular, so that they already have one child with the parental rights and responsibility for them and then if more children then came into the family and what that might mean in terms of a lower payment for it being a subsequent child I think it would feel very unfair if they then took on the care say in a kinship care arrangement of say a, a, a nephew and that then they got the the lower payment because they already have one child um, in the family so I felt that there were still some things that could be worked out um, around that when I was reading through the regulations okay. so thank you yeah just to add to that, there is, yeah, there is a change in, in that which has just recently been made to the Sure Start Maternity Grant. When, when they look at whether there's another child in the household, they ignore a child who is not a birth child of the applicant. Uh, okay. So, that, so that, that could resolve that if that we did, if we did something in. similar yeah. here. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's any more questions. Can I, have a, I just have a final question? It was something that was mentioned in the first panel and something that um, is, is, is of concern, personal concern for, for me, um, and that was to do with the situation of asylum seekers. Obviously, the whole ethos of the grant is to reduce child poverty and to um, ensure that children have the best possible start um, when they're born, when they're going to nursery, and, and, and when they're entering school. But there's an indication that that might fall foul of the rules that the Home Office have regarding um, financial support for asylum seekers. Have you had any experience or any thoughts about people in that circumstance? I mean, as I understand it, um, I think under asylum support, I think there's a small payment, well, a payment of £300 for a new baby under this, the Home Office asylum support regime which is obviously uh, reserved. So whether this could, would be allowed to be paid to people in receipt of asylum support as one of the qualifying benefits, which for free school meals, for example, that is essentially listed as a qualifying benefit, asylum support from the Home Office. So if, if there's a way that could be done, then yeah, we would support that because that group is particularly uh, uh, yeah, in, in a high risk of poverty. Um, Looking at it more widely, as was mentioned earlier on, people with no recourse to public funds, I, I was expect because the maternity grant at the moment is listed as a public fund, so I was expecting that this would be listed as a public fund, so that would be, a, a, again, a reserved exclusion. Mm -hmm. 
but you know, again, if there's any way to negotiate about that, then again, that would be welcome because it's another group in, in poverty and would need the support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I kind of share, share those thoughts, and I think it's a particular concern in terms of addressing child poverty in Scotland if we end up having these particular groups that seem to slip through the net in terms of our new social security system. Um, I had a, maybe it's a question back to Mark actually, but um, I wondered sometimes if we could see the child in terms of like in their own kind of autonomy, um, whether or not they could be eligible as a child in need under section 22 of the 95 Act. Um, the Children's Scotland 95 Act, and that almost that the that the support then is 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 provided, and there's a duty on local authority to them, and whether or not that's not seen as a public funds, I, I don't think that that's necessarily used very often. But I wondered whether or not it, it could be. I don't know. There might be a legislative. Sure. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's hard sure. to me that if we did that, so we addressed that question. There was another panel where we've identified that there might be some EU nationals that don't qualify because of the politics of the EU and, and where we ended up, if you remember the agreement that you had to be in, in the, the UK for so long before you qualify for benefits. Would that be a bit um, uneven then? If we, so if you solve the asylum seeker question by saying, well, that'd be a qualifying benefit, look at the child but then we've got EU nationals if they've not been here for, I think it's up to four years, five years, whatever, that wouldn't qualify, well, well, I was just thinking. <laughs> but potentially if you use that, that argument in terms of um, we have a, a duty of care and welfare for the child, almost regardless of what the parents' legal status is in the country, then arguably you, you could use it for the EU nationals group as well. I'm just not sure whether or not legally you're ever allowed to use it, um, but I... I would think that there's aspects of, like, if you have children in destitute measures, like almost if the, if the parents almost relinquished their child at a social work, you know, office and said, you know, they were not able to care for them, that child would become a looked after child, in which case they then would then have all the support they should have. Obviously, that is not remotely the scenario that we would want, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think through that there actually are some particular scenarios about duty of care and these being um, a child in need and then having financial support and then obviously through a child in need you can make financial payments, um, one-off payments um, to those families. Might it work? <laughs> I, I, mean, I think it would work in terms of social work support. I suppose the difficulty with the best start grant is who's applying for it and so on. But um, can just come back to the point about European nationals. I think that was another slight concern because the phrase used is habitually resident in Scotland. So I think we need a bit of clarification as to what that means and entails. Um, and secondly, there's also the qualifying benefit requirement. So plenty of European nationals can get the qualifying benefit. And I think the idea is that that would essentially mean they are accepted as habitually resident in Scotland. But I think what I wanted to flag up was that we do see a lot of cases where there's um, issues about how the DWP and HMRC apply that test to European nationals and they often need advice to challenge it and so on. So I think, again, it could be a role if someone doesn't get the best start grant because they're not getting a qualifying benefit, then there could be a role for getting them advice and, and, and so on to, to check or challenge that decision, particularly affecting European nationals and habitual residents. Okay, um, I think that's the end of questions. You've given us plenty of food for thought and plenty of things to follow up on. So thank you very much for your attendance this morning. And we now move into private session. <laughs>